ready to start a brand new series, and it's going to be called Be Mine. And it's like you saw in the video, Valentine's Day, February. How many of y'all like Valentine's Day? Yeah. No? Like nobody in this room? Like anybody that's married or in a relationship says yes. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't like, I don't, I'm, I, I, <laughs> I think Valentine's Day is kind of lame. No offense. I love my wife, but I choose to let her know 365 days of the year, not just yes. one day of the year. So. Praise Jesus. Thank y'all. Y'all, if y'all clap really loud, she's probably watching outside. She'll be like, oh, he does love me. So, but anyway, so Valentine's Day is coming up and Every month in February, a lot of youth ministries say, hey, we probably need to do a, a series on relationships. But let's just be honest. Probably about 99% of this room is not in a relationship. Who's in, everybody who's not in a relationship, let me hear you. That's a big part of this room. Those of you that are in a relationship, it's cool. It, this, this goes towards you, too. I'm not trying to think you're secluded from that group. But it's a month where sometimes Valentine's Day is frowned upon. Right? It's Valentine's. I don't care what you say. It's Valentine's. Valentine's Day, it does have an M in it. Uh, Valentine's Day. So instead of the, y'all can keep arguing or we'll just be here longer tonight. Anyways, instead of being here longer tonight, arguing over how you say Valentine's, uh, well, I say Valentine's. So instead of doing the typical relationship, uh, how we talk about relationships and how you should be lovey dovey and how you should do things, I thought we should kind of switch it up this month since. 99% 99% of you guys probably aren't dating, but it still applies to everybody. It's not just those. It's cool. See, Joseph knows. But this month, we're going to look at that word love, okay? We're going to spend it over the next three weeks. We're going to take that word love. We're going to look at what it means and, and kind of how it's used. And as you think about love, why does, why does love have so much weight to it? Like when you say the word love, like it has a ton of weight to it. And it, it means a lot. Like for me, guys, take from me be very careful being the first one that uses the L word, okay? And I'm not telling you you can't. If you feel it, go for it. Before Emily and I got married, I was the first one. I said it, and I was kind of like creepy with it. Like I was nervous. I just, yeah, I was kind of creepy with it and nervous. Like I remember we were kind of hanging out, and I, we, I was like, man, I, I, I want to tell her. Like I, I, I do. I love her. I know it, and I really want to tell her. And instead of just like telling her, I was kind of like, like, all cre- like, yeah, like a creepster. I just kind of whispered it into her ear. Here's the bad part. She didn't answer. So she didn't say anything. So in my mind, I'm like, well, maybe I just said it too low. So I remember, I think I said, if I, I got to ask her, but I think I remember whispering it again. I was like, Emily, I want you to know I love you. Still nothing. No answer. No. So my mind is just starting to roll, okay? I'm thinking like, okay, either I said it way too soon. Either she's rethinking her options and she's probably about to leave. Uh, And option C, I was like, maybe she really didn't hear me. And I'm kind of going through my mind. And then suddenly she goes back. She goes, oh, I love you too, babe. I'm sorry. No, she said, I like you. I said that wrong. She said, I like you, not love. So, yeah, I got I got the I like you, not the I love you back. So I'm like, oh, no, Uh, this is bad. So then for the next couple of weeks, it was kind of awkward. Because she was like, I, you know, I was like, well, I've already said it, so I can't, like, go back on it and say, hey, I like you. I have to say, so I'm like, I love you, babe. She's like, oh, I like you, too. <laughs> Knowing she's not really ready to say it, but that word held a lot of weight. It made it kind of awkward for the next couple of weeks. And so that word love carries a lot with it. But I think love, I think love's also an overused word. Do you guys agree? Gets overused. How many of you have actually said the word love more than five times a day? And you didn't mean it towards somebody you cared about. You just said the word love more than like five. If you said it one time, how many of y'all said the word love at some point in fashion day? Okay. So at some point you may be like, man, I love that TV show. Like, I love it, man. I'm so, I'm, I'm so, I, I love it. I love watching it. Or maybe you say, guys, I love this song. I love it. Like, I, I, it's the only song, I've got it on repeat. I probably listen to it at least 50 times a day. So I love this song. You may be one of those weird people that says, I love Starbucks coffee. I love it. I love Starbucks. That's just awkward. You could also go Anchorman route and say, like, I love lamp. Okay. Every time, every time I hear people like randomly using the word love, that's like the first thing that comes to my mind. It's just, we yell out the word love for just random things. How many of you have passed around that note in elementary school, maybe middle school? There's probably one or two of you this week that's already done it. 
and you pass that note to that girl that you like, and you say, do you want to be my boyfriend? Do you want to be my girlfriend? Do you love me? And you say, circle yes or no. You have no idea what, yeah, check yes or no, circle yes or no. You have no idea what it means. You have no idea why you, you put it. You're just like, hey, I, obviously, if I'm in a relationship, I got to use the word love. I got to say love. So that word love holds a lot with it, but I think it goes a lot deeper than the ways that we use it. Even in our daily, uh, our daily lives, we use the word love way more than we think about it. So this month, we're going to dissect it. We're going to take that word love, but what we're going to do is look at it from a perspective of God and look at how God views the word love. Because love is God himself, and God offers his love to us freely. See, God wants us to be able to learn to love ourselves so we can love others. So this month, we're going to do that. We're going to take that apart. We're going to dissect it. Like, for instance, tonight, our message is called God's Love for Us. And so we're going to look at why God loves us and why the word love holds so much weight with God. So before we get started, let's just take a moment. Let's bow our heads and just say a prayer. So... Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the students that are here. We thank you for the word that you've given to us, God. I just pray that you open their minds so they can, uh, so they can just retain it, open their ears so they can hear it, and God, just open their hearts uh, so they can take it and use it this week. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. So the word love happens in relationships a lot. And for me, in middle school, I would like to say I was somewhat of a ladies' man, okay? I'm glad my wife's not in here listening. She's probably perking up now hearing it. But in, middle, in elementary school, I was somewhat of a ladies' man. Now, when I got into middle school and high school, guys, I, like, tinkered off, okay? Like, I did a complete nosedive. But when I was younger, I like to think of myself as a ladies' man. And so I had a couple ladies when I was in elementary school, okay? You know, that's when it's real serious. And I remember it's probably what it was, guys, is, like, the Cheetos that were always all over my face during lunch just pulls them in, okay? If you ever need anything, you need some help in that area, that does it every single time. And so I remember this girl that I had dated, uh, and I wanted to impress her. Like, I wanted to make sure that I'm like, okay, this is, I'm in a relationship. Like, we're kind of seeing each other at recess, and, you know, that, and that's really the only time we saw each other. That was the extent of our relationship. So we hung out at recess, and, you know, we're kind of the ones walking around where everybody's watching. We're like, yeah, we're together. What? We're holding hands. And so we're serious, and we're taking it to that level that we get to hold hands. And, and, but I wanted to make her happy. So one of the ways that I thought to myself, well, I just I need to give her things. Now, in elementary school, guys, I don't have a job, okay? I have no way to get money. Uh, so, I mean, there's nothing I can do. So how do, I, how do you think I went about getting things for her? I, I don't share Cheetos. <laughs> I took it out of my mom's jewelry box, okay? Now, now you got to understand, okay? I know, even at that age, I know the difference between something that's valuable and something that's not. I'm talking like little sterling silver, like some like little crappy things, okay? So I would take them every once in a while. And I would give her a gift. I'd be like, hey, babe, look what I got for you. You know, I'm showing her off at recess. Like, hey, guys, this is what I got for my girl. Okay, I'm bringing this to her. So I would do this every so often. I wouldn't do it every single day, but I'd always try and, and bring something to her. Well, one thing, and I'm not, don't go home and tell your mom and dad that I told you, like, hey, when Pastor Adam told me that if I want to impress a girl, I got to take stuff out of your jewelry box. It's not, that's not what I'm saying. But the well does run dry, okay? Eventually, there's only so much in there that you can take and give out before you realize if I do any more, I'm going to get caught. So the well runs dry. And I remember being on the recess, being out there on the playground. And so she's like, hey, so uh, you got a gift for me today? I'm like, no, I don't, I don't really have anything else I can give. I can't give anything else out. And she's like, okay. And, you know, that's, I'm thinking that's it. I'm like, okay, that went better than I thought it would. Next day, guess what I find? She's hanging. She, well, she's holding hands with another boy. I don't remember his name. But I'm not, I'm a, guys, I'm a lover, not a fighter, so I didn't let it get under my skin. Yeah, I know, that's a plot twist. So next day I find her talking to some other guy. But guess what that taught me? That meant that love had a condition to it. That in our relationship, even as kids, I'm taught that the word love has some type of condition that's attached to it. Now, what that means is, that condition means that love is present If like A, B, C, and D are there, right? Like that means as long as these factors are in the relationship that it's going to be there, especially when the world talks about love, it always kind of puts a condition on that word uh, that we talk about. Love has conditions attached to it. And what that word is that's attached to love is the the word if. I will love you if, okay? So maybe it's something like, I will love you if you stop talking to these people. 
How many of you have ever dated somebody that they did not like your friend? And they're like, hey, you, this guy's got to go, okay? I don't want to talk to him. I don't want you hanging out with him. They're done, okay? So I'll, I'll love you. I'll keep dating you if you stop talking to these people. Maybe you're also one of these people that had somebody in a relationship that say, hey, I'll love you if you stop wearing those clothes. You look ridiculous. There's no reason to wear a V-neck shirt that shows your chest hair. Like, you got to let that go, okay? Maybe you're one of those. You have somebody that tells you you got to stop wearing those clothes. Maybe you've been that person that had a relationship that you've had a best friend that you've had since you were like three, four, five years old, and maybe they're the opposite sex. You have a girl or a guy that's one of your best friends, and you've dated somebody that says, look, they got to go, okay? They got to get out of here. I don't want to talk. I don't want you talking to that person. You need to remove them from your life. So I'll love you if you remove that person from your life. How many of you have probably ever dated somebody that you have to bring them things all the time? Like they, it's a relationship based on like gifts. Like I'll love you if you give me something good. If you bring me good gifts, look at your hands held high. So been there. Is it coffee or more expensive? Coffee, something more expensive, bigger. So, but you can be in that relationship where I love you if you bring me something. You bring me things. You have to, you bring me something. Maybe you're that person that says, I'll love you if, and this is never going to happen for us, you stop playing video games. Wow. Like, you play video games like, wait, like my wife knew before we got into this, it was like, I love my wife, I love Addison, I love God, and then at least in that top five video games are somewhere, okay? So, I'm not saying any of them are above her, but I do love video games. You might be in that. You might be in that relationship where it says, I'll love you if you remove these things from your life, if you pull them out. Now, sometimes that phrase, love you if, it's in our world. And we hear that. We see that all the time when we're in those relationships where they talk about, I'll love you if you do these things. So what that means is, is that the word love to you is met when it has criteria attached to it. You have to meet a certain standard to feel that love or have that love. And what happens is it becomes natural because in all the relationships you have, and in, when I say relationships, it doesn't mean that it's just somebody that's boyfriend or girlfriend. It could be family. It could be friends. It could be that relationship. But it becomes second nature because you see it and experience all the time. Maybe you've been in that relationship where you've dated that person that has said only I love you to get what they want because they've used those words to just say I love you if you do what I want you to, if you do these things. You may even go as far as being somebody that's an athlete, a musician, a musician, or somebody that's good in school with academics, and you hear the word love all the time when you do things good, when you win that game, or you score that goal, or you have a great concert, or you score the grades that you're supposed to score, and you hear it all the time, oh, we love you, you're awesome, you're great. But when you have times of failure, you don't hear it. You don't hear the word love. So when you're in that point in your life when that's all you need, somebody to build you up, you don't hear that because it came with conditions. I'm only going to love you if you're successful. I'm only going to love you if you're this. And so what it becomes about is meeting expectations. And that's what that word love comes down to is meeting those things. And it says, then I'll be loved if I become that person. So in your mind, you may say, okay, if I become the person that they want me to be, then they'll love me. And then maybe they'll love me for who I am if I become that person. But here's the problem. The problem with thinking that, the problem with attaching expectations to the word love is our view of how God loves us sometimes becomes the same. When we attach expectations to the word love, and what that means is now we say, well, God will love me if. God will love me if I'm the one standing down front, raising my hands, doing, you know, doing worship. I don't know why I'm doing it. I'm just down here doing it. So if I'm the one that's down here, I'm the one that's raising my hand, I'm the one that's, that, sh- that makes it look like I love God, then he'll love me because at, at least I'm putting forth an effort. God will love me if I don't cheat on this test. Like I have the chance and I really should, but if I don't do it, then God's going to love me. And God's going to love me more for that. You may also be thinking to yourself, well, God will love me if I'm just here. Like, I don't have to put forth any effort. I can go ahead and just tune out. I can just sit there. I can make it look like I'm taking notes, but really I'm just doodling. Whatever it is, as long as I'm here, as long as it looks like to God that I'm making an effort, then he's going to love me. Then God will love who I am. So what if God's view of loving you is different? What if it's different than that? 
What if God's view and God's definition of love doesn't actually contain the word if? So there are no expectations. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Here's what it says. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I'm going to have our media team leave this up here. How many of you guys are like grammar hacks? Like you're one of those people, like if somebody uses the word your and they're trying to do the apostrophe like R-E, you're like calling people right there, calling people out all the time in a text message. Just be safe and just use you and R. Covers all areas. But you're a grammar hack. Like you call people out. I am the world's worst for just using uh, Y-O-U-R for everything. Okay, it's shorter. It's faster. I don't have to go through the, go for the, uh, the comma. It's good to go. So if you're a grammar hack, have any of you guys noticed in that verse anything that's, that's different? No, no colon. If you look at that verse, remember the Bible was written years and years and years and years and years ago. The word demonstrates, that third word, I want y'all to point that word out. The word demonstrates, it's in present tense. Okay? What that means is, is right now. So as you read that, God demonstrates his love for us. So right now, in this very moment, God is loving us. It doesn't say demonstrated. It does not past tense. It doesn't say in the past God loved us. It says right now that God is loving us. Now, the next point I want to carry with that is if you look at that, I want you to take another word. Take that word sinners, okay? If you look at that word sinners and you take that apart, that essentially means that we're rebellious from God. That's what that word sinner means, that we turn our backs on God we go against what God says. We don't trust what he does. We're rebellious against what he wants. He may say, hey, don't go here. Don't do that. Don't break these. Uh, so we're kind of being rebellious against God and who he is. So if you take that, word, uh, take that word sinners, I want you to replace it with the word enemies. Because essentially, sinners and enemies is the exact same thing. And if you look at that and read that verse for that, what it says is, is that while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us. So when we've turned our back on God, and we all have, myself included, we've had times where we've turned our back on God. We've had times we hadn't listened to him. We've had times where we've gone the complete opposite direction that we know God is not telling us to go. We've been sinners. We've been rebellious against God. But what's crazy is in all that, even when you're an enemy of God, he still loves you. And God still loves you so much that God gave up his own son. Now, his son, Jesus Christ, is perfect in every single way. Never made a mistake, never did anything wrong. Jesus is perfect, but God still gave up his son because he wanted to show us how much he loved us. So allowing his son to be killed lets him know how much he loves us, and how much he wants to be a part of our life. See, in God's world, there's no conditions. God has no conditions for how he loves us. That means there's no ifs. That means that this very moment that God is loving on you, that God's not going to say, well, I'll love you if you serve. I'll love you if you're here every night. I'll love you if you read your Bible every day. I'll love you if, no matter what you do, even while you're still an enemy of God, he loves you. Even while in this very moment you crave sin, and we do, we're human, we crave sin every single day. Whether we say something we shouldn't, we watch things we shouldn't, we look at things that we shouldn't, or we're involved or around things that we shouldn't, that's craving sin. So when we go against God and we're rebellious against God, even in all that, he still loves us. And the example that he used was to allow his son to hang on that cross and allow him to give up his son. So how do we apply this logic to our life? How do we apply this look of love, how God views what love really is? And here's the question that I wrote down that I want you guys to ask yourself. How many of you have ever received a gift that you didn't, that you didn't deserve? How many of you received a gift that you didn't deserve? I know I have. I'm sure others in this room, you've gotten a gift. You didn't deserve it. It just showed up. For me, this happened with a buddy of mine. Now, see, this buddy of mine didn't have a car, I typically drove him everywhere he went, and this was back in high school. My first car was like what was called a Honda Vigor, and that thing was stout, okay? 
It had, I had like tinted windows. I had like 12 inch subs in the back. I had low profile rims. Like I would, every time I go to school every day, they knew I was there. And so my buddy rode with me every single day to school. And I remember one day after school, we're driving home and I'm driving in a drop off. We get to the house and we see there's a truck in the driveway. Now it's not his, it's not his parents. So we're thinking, okay, he has guests over. There's friends somewhere. We have no idea who it is. So we pull up as we come into the driveway right behind the truck that's sitting there. We see his dad just walk out. Now, while his dad walks out, man, you can see he has this biggest grin on his face. So in my mind, I'm thinking like, oh, his dad just bought him a car for no reason whatsoever. And I remember walking up and I remember me and him getting out. And as his dad walked out, you could see how excited he was because he had spent all day long on this car. He had washed it. He had waxed it. He had vacuumed it. uh, He had put everything you can just trying to make it look nice. And I remember the conversation that my friend and his dad had. And his dad was like, son, look, I bought you this car. I know it's not much. I know it doesn't look like much. I've tried to spend all day cleaning and just trying to get it right. And I just, son, I just want you to know how much I love you. And my buddy was kind of in that point in his life where he said something that you just want to grab right back and he knows he shouldn't. But I felt so awkward standing there because the moment his dad said that, he looked at his dad and goes, that this isn't really what I wanted. And so I was like, I feel awkward. Like, I feel like I need to walk away from this conversation. But at that very moment, he knew that he had messed up. For no reason whatsoever, his dad had gone out, bought a car, put all this time and effort into making it look good. And he just spit it back in his dad's face because it's not what he wanted. So that gift was there. And what my fear is, when I think about this story, is that many of you, your friends, your family, that one day this is exactly how you'll respond to God. Because God has a gift for us. He has that gift of life. He has that gift of eternal life to offer to us. And my fear is that one day that gift is there. It's sitting there. He's just waiting for you to take it. And we're just going to be rebellious against God. We're going to be sinners against God. We're going to take that gift and just give it right back to him instead of just taking it, just receiving it, and just embracing it. See, God's love is perfect. Guys, there's no conditions with it. There's nothing that comes with God's love because he accepts us for who we are. No matter when we mess up, no matter what we said five minutes ago, guys, I can promise you I probably send it at least five or ten times a day. And so that love that we have for God can never be separated from that. We see that in the Bible. It tells us that we cannot be separated from the love of God. And there's a verse that we all know. It's probably one of the most popular verses in the Bible. You could probably know exactly what I'm talking about just because I say the most popular verse in the Bible exactly. John 3.16. And here, I want to use the New Century Version because I love... It's different from how we hear it all the time. And here's what it says. John 3, 16 from the New Century Version. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him may not be lost, but have eternal life. Guys, God loves us so much that nothing, absolutely nothing in this world will keep us from him. That even goes as far as God giving up his own son. He never questioned it, never thought about it. His son went through the most agonizing, painful. He was stabbed. He was spit on. He was made fun of. He was hung from a cross where it's one of the most humiliating ways to go. And he didn't bite an eye at it. He gave up his only son for us. Now, I understand what comes with that. Sometimes it's hesitant. It can be hesitant to accept Christ. It can be hesitant to want to have that lifestyle. Because I understand it's hard at times. I understand it's not easy. I understand we're we're judged. I understand a lot of times right now the media doesn't put Christianity in a good light. All they show is the bad things. I understand there's like tons and tons of Bible verses and and stories that you hear in the Bible and how can I how can I be good? How can I how can I follow the right path? How can I do that? And it can be hard 
to go down that path. It's just, it can be complicated to be a Christian. But what is so awesome about that verse, what's so important to take away from that, this is what I want you to write down in your notes. Here's what I put. I thought this explained it the best way it could for John 3.16. It means God loves, God gives, you believe, and you live. God loves, God gives, you believe, and you live. So God gives us that gift. It gives us that gift of life. It shows that no matter what, no matter where you've fallen short, no matter where you've messed up, no matter if you think, hey, I'm unforgivable, God says, look, my love has no condition. My love is nothing but that, just love. Just bring yourself to me just as you are. In pieces, in whole, whatever it is, bring yourself to God and accept that gift that he has. I want you guys to go ahead and bow your heads for me tonight. As your heads are bowed, maybe you've, maybe you've never heard it explained that way. Maybe you've never understood what God's love means. You've heard people tell you, hey, accept Christ into your heart, your life will change. Say yes, raise your hand, all those things that you hear, but you've never really understood what that means to follow down that path. Guys, I'm here to tell you, God wants you. God wants you to come to him. He wants you to come to him broken. He's not looking to have perfection. God just wants to show you, hey, I love you so much and I will not allow anything to keep us from it that I'm willing to give up my one and only son. I'm willing to sit here and let him hang from a cross. Let him be treated the way that he is just so in the end you'll understand how much I love you. And guys, I promise you, there's no, there's no like secret phrase. There's no, uh, there's no secret way to do it. There's, there's nothing you have to do other than just having a conversation with God, taking time and saying, God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I know you love me. God, I come to you broken. I'm ready for you to make me whole. And guys, that step is as simple as just raising your hand, saying, I want that. I want to go down that path. I want God to change my life. Like I told you, I know it's not easy. I know it's the road less traveled. But what I can promise you is God will change your life. If that's you and you're ready to make that decision, if you're ready to feel what the love of God is, and I, I challenge you, raise your hand today. I see your hand. I see your hand. That's awesome. Maybe you're not ready to fully commit. Maybe you got a few more questions. Daniel talked to you guys about that connect card. We give you a place. If you have those questions, write it down. Guys, I promise you, every single night we go home and read those cards. If you got a question, I'll text you tonight. But guys, just know that God's ready to change your life. God, I thank you again for every single one of these students that are here tonight. I know we say it every single week, but God, they truly could be anywhere else doing anything else tonight, but they chose to be here and to learn more about you. God, I ask that you raise up those students that raised their hand today that said, I'll take that step, that I want to experience the love of Christ. I want to know what that means. And God, I take that you just ask that you take them this week and just show them, be present in their lives, show them what it means to be loved by you. God, for those others in this room that may still have questions or are still wondering, God, I just, God, 
I just pray that you, you as well just show yourself to them. Show them what it means to be in that family, to be loved by you, God. God, I ask that you lay your hand on each and every one of these students this week. I ask that you mold their hearts. I ask that you use them as light for others in their schools, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.